Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Peter Bryant. I'm the Head of Learning Technology and Innovation here at the LSC and I'd like to welcome you to our first Network Ed for the 2015-2016 year. And we're very uh, happy and proud to have a good friend of the LSC, uh, Dr Donna Lamplow here from the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Can somebody let him in? That's what I'm talking about. part of the trick. Um, our Network Dead series is a regular discussion and debate series that we do as part of the work of Learning Technology and Innovation at the school. Uh, and this is going to be hopefully one of those type of sessions where that kind of debate and discussion occurs. Uh, we'd also like to welcome you to uh, a new room at the LSE, which is our parish hall rooms, which uh, effectively go into proper operation into the school as of next week. Uh, so this is the first time this has been used with live people. Uh, so, uh, but we do have the head of the state, the director of the states here, so uh, uh, we should be all right. Um, so the way this will work, we are uh, recording this uh, and hopefully live streaming it. But in order to, because this is going to be quite a, a discussion, in order to get your voices heard on the recording, uh, if when, once the debate happens, I'll come around with the microphone. I am officially mic for you as well. So without further ado, I shall hand over to Donna. Thank you. Um, thank you to Peter and to Jane Secker, who has left us for Austria this week. So she's got a really good excuse to not be here. But um, it was thanks to their invites that I came. And um, I was invited to um, think about the frame for the talk um, in terms of what will those who are teaching and learning need to consider uh, in the run-up to 2020. So um, I have been quite vocal on Twitter and elsewhere about how we shouldn't be talking about the future because that's a really effective way of avoiding talking about the present. And so what I'd like to do is do a little bit of an end run around what's going to happen in 2020 and center the debate around current practices and then I think the implications for the sorts of things that we could do in 2020. So rather than waiting around and seeing what the future is going to be and trying to predict it, um, it would be nice to make some suggestions about ways that we could shape the future uh, of being at university in London in 2020, not just at the LSE, but elsewhere. So what I'd like to do um, is start with a couple of stories. So um, I'm an anthropologist and I've been doing ethnography um, centered in and emanating from libraries since about uh, 2009. Um, and I started off doing field work in the States at my own university at UNC Charlotte and then um, had the good fortune to have a connection to the Institute of Archaeology at UCL. I was brought over to do a very quick pilot library ethnography there and then I did a longer one at UCL. Um, and since then I've also done some work um, at Imperial, at Kingston, uh, and so I have had some experience now observing and analyzing the behavior of students at London universities um, as well as at my own um, institution at UNC Charlotte. Uh, so there was once a time when I was uh, waiting for a colleague <coughs> in the lobby of a university library, and I saw a group of five students walk up to the gate, and they stopped before they got to the gate. And one of them handed the other a card, and four of them went in. The one who had handed that person the card went to the security desk, and what do you think they said? I've lost my card. Could you look me up? I really am a student here at the university, and I, I need to go. It's possible that it's with my gear that I left upstairs at a desk. <laughs> So, so what was he going to do? Was he going to say, no, I don't think so. He looked, he looked her up. She really was a student matriculated at that institution. He let her through. What do you think was going on with that student who got the card handed to them? Wasn't a student at that particular institution. So you've got a group of students, not all of whom who are at that institution, studying together because that's what they do. Right? So the, the current practice, so the fact that I could say what's going on, you know this happens. You know that students who go to King's and Imperial and UCL and the LSE go to places together, institutional places that are not their institutional places, to do their academic work. Because the people with whom they do their academic work are not limited 
to their own network within their university. Another story. So in 2011, that was the first time I went to UCL, and I was interviewing students about their practices, and I had them map where they went on the landscape, not just for whatever they did in the library, but anywhere they did their academic work. And I had a second year archaeology student who mapped all sorts of things for me. He had the Institute of Archaeology library, very small box over here, and then he had the Welcome Library, great big box, and he put, he put, um, lines of significance around it, you know, like comic book style. And uh, he spent most of the interview talking about the welcome and how wonderful a space it was and how you could have food and drink in it and how the reason he knew about that space was because a friend of his had gone to university the year beforehand and had taken him by the hand and showed him this space and said, this is great. This is where you need to do all your work. He didn't say, you should do all your stuff at UCL because you're a student at UCL. He said, look how fabulous this space is. And that was the only place that the student did significant academic work. So again, it's not just about the institutional affiliation of the student that informs where they go and why. It's about what kind of space it is, how welcome they feel at that space, who in their personal network has encountered those spaces, and why they feel that they're significant. And it seems to me that in paying attention to the current practices of students, we have an opportunity to make it more than a shuffle around institutional practices of gatekeeping. So I'd like to think about what the value of getting a university education is. Particularly, what is the value of going to university in London? It's not simply about the degree. If all you wanted was a prestigious degree, there are any number of places you could go that would give you that. But if you go to a London institution, you are also getting the experience of being in London. That's not insignificant. So the experience of students is informed not just by being at university, but by being in a city like London. You've got the potential for diversity, the ability to have a range of people who are not you, to learn from others and encounter and be challenged by all of these different things that cities like London have to offer. And we hear so much about student experience. And what I'd like to do is take that term, student experience, which generally means they did a three-year degree, they lived on campus, they lived off campus, there are these large, totalizing categories of experience. And riff off of a question that a colleague of mine in anthropology asked on Twitter, why do we call it lived experience when it could just be experience? And he got a wonderful answer, and this is one of the reasons I'm a fan of Twitter. Um, a colleague of his made this beautiful argument that lived experience is about the phenomenology of experience. It's the difference between <laughs> I did an archeology span degree at UCL and every day I went into the Welcome Library and I sat down and that was where I read my articles. And then I walked over to the Institute of Archaeology because that's where my lecturers were and I talked to them. And then we met at the Union Pub. The things you do on a day-to-day -day basis are the lived experience. It's the phenomenology of student experience. So let's think about the lived student experience. The lived student experience is I snuck into the library at Imperial so I could work with my friends because that's how I work effectively. So if we ground ourselves in the lived experience of students, what can we do? How do we find out what the lived experience of students is? The anthropologist says you talk to students and you see what they do. And one of the things you can do is you can use instruments like these cognitive maps that I've collected from students in London to have them visualize what their lived experience is. This is a map of all of the learning spaces that this student encounters. So there's a tiny tutorial room. There's a space up there that has lots of desks in it. There's a bedroom here. There are institutional and non-institutional places in students' lived experience. This is actually a map from UNC Charlotte, and what this student has done has mapped spaces 
from the university to their apartment to downtown Charlotte. And I have one map that actually spans from North Carolina into South Carolina. Some of these are cafes. Some of these are institutional buildings. Some of these are personal residences. What do you think their preference is in where they land and where they stay to do their work? What do they need? Sometimes interaction with friends. What? Do, hmm? Space. Space. They need tables. Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. <laughs> they need Wi-Fi. So a lot of these spaces are places that are open 24 hours because they also need to be going whenever they want. A lot of our students work when they're not at university, so they don't actually get a chance to start studying until about half six in the evening. If we close our library at eight, we're kicking students out. This is another London map. Um, the bus is a learning place. Students bring uh, non-digital things to read on public transportation because the Wi-Fi is not always reliable. They print things out. Um, so, so seeing learning places as a network, rather than being concerned about what are they doing at university, but recognizing that the things they do at LSE, at UCL, at UAL, any of the institutions, are embedded in a much larger network that is the city, that is the county, that is the range of places that they could go, depending on where they need to be. And it's not always the ideal space. Sometimes it's just a place where they need to be. And this is true for academic staff as well. This is the map of an archaeologist who's at UCL. This is a picture of his chair at home with his cat. So places have living things that give them meaning and make them comfortable or not. He has also done lines of significance around the Wellcome Library. That's where he met all of his postgraduate students. Despite the fact that he has an office at UCL, there was something about the space at Wellcome that made it necessary to go there. Um, he also works at Cambridge. I hear that's quite a good university. Um, but the more important part about Cambridge wasn't what it could give him for academic stuff, but the fact that his brother's there. And that was why he went to Cambridge. But he considered it part of his academic spaces. Likewise, Yale, Beinecke, very nice library, hear good things about it. It's got excellent pizza in New Haven. And that is the emotional content of the learning spaces that our staff and our students have. And we need to pay attention to that as well. This postgraduate mapped places in Greece as well as places in London. So it's not limited in space. It's not limited to institutions. It's about who they are and where they need to be and where they want to be. And I would love for us to think about this in thinking about how can we as institutions not just recognize these practices, but facilitate them so that they can do a better job at the things they need to do, so they can be more effective at being researchers, at being writers, at being students, at being scholars. So what happens when we make networks like this visible to other people? So students recognize this. Students can say, I do this and this and this. We have this sort of mapping happening um, only because I asked. So if we know that it's a networked experience, if we know that learning is a networked experience, digitally and physically, how can we visualize that? What can we do as institutions to try to work towards making that explicit? So in another part of my work, um, I collaborate with uh, Dave White at UAL on visitors and residents work. And this is a way of talking about motivations to engage with spaces, with digital tools, with information. And one of the things that we do in workshops is we ask people to map their practice and then there's a so what part of it where we say, okay, you've mapped what you do. What would you like to change? And before we ask them what they would like to change, we ask them to go around and look at what all of the other people in the room do. And learning from the practices of their colleagues in the room, what might be possible that they didn't already know. So it's not just about visualizing your practice, but it's about becoming aware of what else is out there by seeing what other people's practices are. And I love this map because the, the arrows of direction are, are arrows of intention. I would like to continue to do this, but I want to move it into this sphere of my life. And it's not possible to have aspirational 
discussions about what I would like to do um, as effectively if you don't first see what you're doing. So again, grounding our sense of what could be possible for our students, where we could move their practices, by being aware of the things that they're doing now. So I, I'm a big fan of mapping, as you may have guessed. Um, and I think that you can't change things if you don't know what the situation on the ground is. So let's start from what we know. We know that learning is a network experience. So here's where we are. I get lost every time I come here. I go in the wrong place. So, this is the LSC. All these red dots are academic institutions in London. And this is just like a piece of it, right? What if all these were connected? What could you connect these with? Could you do it with digital tools? Could you do it with relationships? What if the students from the University of London knew that if they were down here on the South Bank, they could walk into any academic institution and do the stuff that they needed to do because it was a network? What if they knew that that was possible because this network was somehow made visible? Because it's all well and good to say, well, it's possible and they could do that, but if a network isn't visible, does it matter if it exists? I would suggest it doesn't. So it doesn't matter that somebody who's got the keys to the kingdom knows that you can walk into X space. It, I had no idea until about three weeks ago, uh, Maria can correct me if I'm wrong, can anybody just walk into the library at the LSE if you ask? No, you can get, okay, so you can walk in and get a guest pass. So, you, so, so there's still gatekeeping, right? And so you don't have to have institutional affiliation. And this was one of the things I was really struck by when I started working in London is the, is the amount of gatekeeping that is required to get into these spaces in the first place. I work for the state. I work for a state institution. Anybody can walk into our library. And, and they do. Um, and it is our responsibility to provide them with the space to do the things that they need to do. So that was an adjustment for me, but I think it also has implications for the lived experience of students who are doing things in London. They're constantly encountering gate-kept spaces. But we know that they're treating the entire city of London as a university. We know they're already doing it, but they're doing it in ways that are doing end runs around ways that we have made it more difficult for them to do that. So think of space as a service. It's not just a place where we are, but the provision of space and the opportunity for students and staff to make these places. Please come here. It's something that we could actually take some responsibility for collectively. We could determine that this is an important thing, not just to recognize, but to facilitate. So particularly in a context where institutions are requiring students to do things like group work, we're acknowledging that they are not going to be able to go out into the world in isolation, you have to be able to work with other people, we assign them work in groups as a part of their modules. If we as institutions are saying to our students, hey, this is important, then it is an abdication of our responsibility as educators to say, yeah, you could probably go do that at Starbucks. How dare we say to our students, you need these skills, you need to do this sort of thing, and then leave it up to them to find the spaces in which they could do this. And furthermore, why are we getting in the way of them experiencing London as it should be experienced? Members of academic staff don't come to universities in London just so they can work with people at their own institution. Why on earth would we want our students to have that limited an experience of this city? So this is a common good argument. This is a what could we do if we broke down some of these barriers and made it easy for students to flow in and out of spaces. Because they experience these spaces as porous through subverting the boundaries. What if institutions made them more porous? Because they're not currently that easy to get into. There are literal gates. All the no's. No smoking, fine. I'm from California, no smoking. No food or drink. No large bags. When they say no large bags at public libraries, 
What are they doing? <coughs> Keeping out the homeless. Switch off mobile phones. I love that one. That's not going on. A whole lot of no. Don't do this. Don't do that. And if you have too much stuff, if you're the right kind of person, you probably shouldn't be in here. Even digitally, and in terms of, well, we have these things, you could go in and do this. You could go to the Sconal site and you can apply for Sconal access, but you still have to do a thing. M25 consortium, I'm not going to read all this for you, but you know, yay, consortium, but then you have to do all this stuff. This is gatekeeping. And it's a way for you to say, well, you know, they're connected, but only if you do the work, right? Only if you figure it out, only if you navigate the system. It's not the default. The f default is not networked. The network is if you can figure it out, kid. And I feel like we owe our students more than that, more than just, oh, you could figure it out. So what problem are we trying to address when we throttle access like this? Um, I make the, the point of the, the homeless person in a public library. What problem are they trying to address when they try to keep homeless people out of these public spaces? Um, I think libraries are used to thinking about the sort of who gets to come in and who gets to come out a lot more than some other institutional spaces precisely because there is a public library piece to libraries generally. Um, the problem of homeless people in the library is not actually a library problem. It's a society problem that's erupting in the library. So if the city has a homelessness problem, the library is not going to be able to fix it by banning people. But the library could work with municipal authorities to try to get services and to try to network with other institutions to actually address the core problem, which is that people don't have anywhere to live. And there are public libraries in the US, for instance, San Francisco and DC are really good examples that have social workers on staff. And they have institutional things in those buildings that can address the real problem, rather than simply banning it and attempting to make it invisible. So London universities that might be concerned about conserving their own resources for their own students aren't going to garner resources for themselves by banning other students from their locations. So if the problem is, if we let all of the students into our space, there's not going to be enough stuff for our students. Maybe it's a larger problem. Maybe the problem is that we're not actually dedicating enough resources to university education in the first place. And perhaps a consortium of London universities could do more to shift the conversation rather than attempting to gatekeep their own places in favor of just their students. I'd like to remind ourselves that chopping cities like London into silos is missing the point of a city like London. So I want to talk just briefly about um, a project at Cambridge, colleagues of mine, um, futurelive.wordpress.com, um, is trying to address some of the visualization things. So this is a what if, what would it look like? What kinds of things could we build? What sorts of things could we engage in to, to make networks visible and actionable and relevant to students? And one of the things they're doing in Cambridge libraries is, is building things like Space Finder, a digital tool to have all the different places the students could go be made visible and accessible because they are more visible. So if they need to study, they can find not just spaces within Cambridge, but also privately owned spaces, cafes, these sorts of things. If such a thing were to happen at UCL, you could have a situation where they've actually linked the various hubs that may or may not be libraries with library spaces, with cafe spaces, um, with nearby university spaces, and you could you could have an app for that, right? The technology may shift, but the principle would be the same, that you, need, you can leverage the digital to create the connections that then allow for students to build the relationships in other um, locations. So I would encourage you to go and just look at the work as a way of thinking about what might be possible. 
what are some of the ways that we could begin to start thinking um, at a very basic level on how to connect the spaces that are currently only connected by the folk practices of students and the institutional affiliations of academic staff who work with each other, but still a fair amount of gatekeeping um, in terms of the students. So I'm going to stop talking um, because I would like for um, the room to push back and say, or say yeah, but what, what would that look like? What could happen if collectively things were built in London around relationships and the digital um, that actually allowed for us to talk about the London University? Who wants to go first? Come on, people. Come on. <laughs> I just scared them. You just repeat the question. Mm -hmm. oh, is, it, is that question? Well, it's a start. This is a live stream. You don't need to. It's not you. <laughs> There's a few. Alright, um, hands ha for each institution. City. City University of London. Um, King's. Um, LSE. Great figure. Can I have those new ones? UCL. UCL. Excellent. Imperial. No, but they're watching online. I know. Yeah. That's <laughs> tough. Yeah. Oh, sorry, so I'm not sorry. <laughs> Greenwich. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, so this is my impression on my observations of having worked in the city for a few years. Am I completely misinterpreting what's going on? Do you really feel like it's an open city for your students and they can go wherever they need to go or want to go? Is there a reason that you would want to keep your students in your institution? Because I'm, you know, I would love to know the rationale for that, not because I need to shoot it down, but I, I feel like there are things that we do because we assume that that's how it's done. Is there a rationale for keeping students? Right here. Yeah? Well, I guess, um, you know, senior management of our institutions are very concerned about the institutional brand. They want it to be, you know, the, the LSE experience or the UCL experience. Yeah. So they want to deliver real value to their students and make them feel special, and they don't really want it to be open doors at all because they want to make sure that their students are paying fees to them, they're getting value and feel that not, you know, that it's not it's like a moot really where you know you're providing free education to the world. But what about the students who are paying fees to you? Mm -hmm. So I think those are the sorts of questions that the senior management have to have to address. So I, I would have some answers for that, right? I I would say first of all, the students that I work with, even if they're working in other spaces, there is no doubt in their minds that they are a student at LSE. They are a student at the Institute of Archaeology. Their identity and affili affiliation to the program that they're moving through is, is quite decoupled, actually, from the spaces in which they need to work. Um, because the spaces in which they need to work aren't necessarily always determined by the institution. Right? Sometimes they have a job. Sometimes they live in the South Bank. Sometimes there are all sorts of reasons independent of, I'm a student at UCL that draws them to other places. So there, the value add piece is interesting because, because I, as I started with, you, why would you recruit students to study in a city like London and try to keep them in a silo? Sometimes it's more about keeping students and other institutions out. But I know that if our library is full of students from UCL mm -hmm. and denying space to LSE students, that we present them because we have LSE students. Mm -hmm. There are already UCL students in your LSE library. <laughs> So, so this is the thing. You know, these practices, would recognizing these practices suddenly make everything go out of control and nobody has enough resources? So you're going to get away with that question from me. <laughs> 
students now as our, our people, and people have networked, intersecting identities and sensitive community. So a student in London who is going to UCL, I feel like I'm picking on you guys, but I work, I work there a lot, so I think about UCL students an awful lot. They have these nested identities, right? They are um, an archaeology student. They are a second year student. Um, they are a student who lives close to the university. They are a student who lives on the South Bank. They are um, a student who is from London who is attending. They are a student who is not from London. They, uh, and so their personal background and the subject that they're teaching, all of these different things inform who they are and what they do. The question of opening up these spaces and how might that confound their sense of belonging to their institution Again, I think this is something that's already played out. They already work in other institutional spaces, and it doesn't actually mess with their sense of belonging. Now, it might do the dangerous thing in suggesting that some institutions have done a better job of configuring spaces than others, but you know that's information, right? So if you've got a space that none of your students want to work in, why would you want to force them to work in it by simply saying, well, you're at our institution, you better like it or you know, leave it? Maybe institutions could learn from each other and how to configure their spaces more effectively. Um, so, so I wonder, you know, is it, is, it, is it fear? If they go over there and work over there, are they going to leave us? Well, they, they work in inadequate spaces now and they stay in those programs because it's, of course, more than space. It's the um, lecturers that they interact with. It's their fellow students. So a sense of community is not limited to space, but it's enacted within particular spaces. It's enacted within the digital, it's enacted within the physical. I'm not worried about students forgetting where they belong and where they're identified with, because they're already engaging in that. They're already doing that. We're in the parish hall. I'm going to give an amen. It's been just a really small point, actually. I'm really loving this debate and conversation. And so many thoughts going through my head in terms of where I work. I work at a consortium of colleges based in Bloomsbury, so all um, partners of the university. Um, but actually, what I've just been thinking about is how times have changed, because I was a UCL student mm -hmm. a hundred years ago. Um, and I love being a UCL student, and I love being part of that community. Well, and so I think that you are still going to get students, and I think you do, you know, I, 
it's not all the students, right? There are going to be students who are only going to work in these spaces. There were students who worked exclusively in the Institute of Archaeology Library because that's their space and their library. And they're actually very cross, even with people using the other computer cluster down the hallway because that's their, that's their cluster. So, so yeah, you can get that sort of possessive sense of space. But it can work to their disadvantage as well. I mean, there, there are ways that, that you might want to say, that's fantastic, that you really, really want to, to be at home in archaeology. But, but there's this other world, right? So the extent to which we could challenge our students' comfort levels with the familiar. And again, you don't come to a city like London to hang out with people who are just like you. My God, why would you do that? I mean, it's just, but there is a comfort to being with people who you perceive to be just like you. And I feel like it's our responsibility as educators to give students a safe space to, in which to experience that discomfort. <coughs> I love this. This is the first time I've been wanting to do this for years. I've been wanting to have a live Twitter stream up next to me when I'm talking because I feel like that's what happens in conferences. Anyway. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah. Uh, I'll be coming mic while it's only for No, that's all right. Anyway. Ah, excellent. Fair enough. Question that how do you, I'm referring to the point that you made about coming in and working with other institutions, how do you build cross institutional curricula to the beginning where you yeah. encourage and facilitate? Well, the, the other thing I would say about that, the concern about curriculum, right? How do you have a curriculum over here and a curriculum over there? Might need some shifting in what we mean by curriculum, right? So if your curriculum is content, that's tricky, right? If, if your curriculum is this box of information needs to be dumped into our students' heads and, and that's the curriculum. Maybe the curriculum is about processes and about skills and about these sorts of things. And those are things that are easily shared and actually more effectively practiced when you've got more than one institution doing it. Um, it's, it's, it's the amount of critical thinking that happens when you're working with an unfamiliar institution initially, right? If you're partnering with people who aren't your safe place, um, but who your safe place is sending you to, right? Yeah, I, now I'm thinking of um, overnight uh, with kids, right? You, you trust somebody enough to send your child, and then they learn to, they eat that cereal in the morning. I never get to eat that cereal, right? And they, <laughs> and they get to go to bed at 10. That's crazy. I never get to do it. So, so it opens things up, right? How could we open things up for our students? And they can come back to us, and they can have this sense of, this is home, and this is what's familiar to me. But then from home, I get to go to all these different places. And they welcome me, and they teach me different things. So, so I'm not talking a homogenous London, right? I'm not saying everybody needs to be all the things, and this is the point of we can't be all the things, but we could network all of our different things so that collectively they're stronger than in isolation. I feel like this is a really good minute. Just <laughs> We were at Alt, yeah. Um, the Learning Technology Conference. But uh, there were some really interesting presentations there about open education mm -hmm. uh, and various other matters as well. Um, I was impressed by UCL and their attempt to reconsider the co curriculum. Mm. Um, that experience of students depend upon but sits certainly outside of content. And for me, it's a really interesting in terms of teaching and learning, mm -hmm. in particular the learning, and as a space where the peer could be the most significant person they uh, encounter. Um, 
so for me, a lot of the connectivity between our various institutions may well actually sit in the space that we need to redefine this notion of the co-curriculum, where we uh, are supportive of each other, where we are critical of each other, where we provide um, partnerships to each other as learners and, and so forth, where we provide feedback, where we provide authenticity, where we make sense of the formal curriculum. Um, and it's a space that we, certainly in Sheffield and uh, Sheffield Hall, where I'm from, but what well, we need to do this right now, I know that. Yeah. Um, and it's good to see UCL on the case there too. And I'm sure there are others that have got their heads around this, but maybe that connects to what we're talking about today. Yeah, I think co-curricular spaces are really good starting point, right? So, so again, it, it, it does an end run around um, perhaps academic departments wanting to be sort of possessive of, you know, well, this is, uh, this is our students and this is what we want them to do. An awful lot of co-curricular things that happen at my university are very deliberately about sending them out and making them do something else that's, that's not UNC Charlotte. That enriches and enhances their attachment to our university because we're secure enough to send our students out to other places and we have faith that they will come back, right? and they will come back with stuff that we couldn't give them all by ourselves. Absolutely. Next. So everybody agrees? So okay, so then, so then who's gonna start, right? Because we've got what, five, five years? Yeah. Yeah, what could happen in five years? Like what could be put in place? For me, I think the first the first thing, I mean, in some ways, the students have already put a lot of this in place, as you've discussed. Um, there was something interesting I saw uh, just walking down uh, Fleet Street towards the station. Big sign on the Starbucks that says, you know, coffee, whatever, whatever, so myself, coffee, I'm sure it is. Um, <laughs> down there saying, and a great place for LSE students to study. Yeah. Which I thought was a really interesting sort of shift in the fact that it's a marketing point yep. that we that we don't have enough spaces for them. Nope. That we don't have spaces with ubiquitous Wi-Fi or mm -hmm. enough PowerPoints or whatever else. Yeah. So in some ways, I think my question is, maybe the question actually isn't it's about us starting it. Maybe it's about us listening to the people who've already started it. Yeah, because like I said in the Cambridge example, they're not just limiting it to the university spaces, they're, they're acknowledging that students are working in Starbucks, students are working in the independent cafes, students are working in pubs. Yes? Yeah, I've, I've heard from the network manager at Cambridge, they have an active program of putting EU rooms in the pubs and cafes around Cambridge because they survey the students. Yeah. And they ask them, where do you want to study? It's not in the library, it's not in the, it's not in the, it's not in the lecture theatres, yeah. it's in the pub, it's in the cafe. It's in the cafe, yeah. And, and libraries know it's not that they're not in the library because they're all over the library, right? So, so again, thinking, well, we shouldn't, you know, send them to the pubs or send them. We're not sending them anywhere. They're already there. <laughs> so, how, you know, how do we pay attention to that? How do we take that present and, and be deliberate about it? This, this is an exercise in mindfulness and recognition and saying, all right, they're already there. How can we make this better for them? If we recognize it, then, then we can take some of the stuff that we know about what would be good for our students and enhance those spaces. Yes? I think that's one way to make it happen, is to engage student unions. So I, I, that's a way to make it happen, yeah. we can engage student unions, because I think the student voice would be quite you know, um, sort of powerful in talking to management about yeah. open Yes, so it sounds like one of the barriers to overcome is the notion of the you know, senior people at your university that this, this, is, this would be a risky thing, this would be an inadvisable thing, this would be something that would not be good for the university. There needs to be a way for the voice that argues for this to get some traction. And you're right, student voices in the era of the NSS and lots of other different things. You know, if we're really concerned about student experience and student satisfaction, could we not pay attention to the actual lived experience of students and the things that they're doing that make their university experience an effective one? Not an efficient one, not a vocational one, but effective. And leverage those arguments to get to a point where we could actually try. Uh, I just saw someone sent me a link to um, how a student union 
actually is doing a tour around coffee shops and other study spaces, yes. making <laughs> students get to hold it's brilliant. And I just thought, maybe the library's in there. You should go on that tour. No, really, go on that tour. Listen to what students are telling each other about where to go. And, and learn from, you know, if the places that they say to go are no institutional places, that tells you something. That's actionable, right? You can say, okay, just because we tell them they should be working in the library, they should be working in the hubs, and they're not, maybe should isn't enough. They have to have a motivation to engage. This is back to visitors and residents again. Nobody's going to go on Twitter just because Twitter. They're going to go there because there are people there, because there's information there, because there's a reason to do that sort of thing. Nobody's going to go to the library because they should go to the library. They're going to go to the library because there are people and there are things with which to engage because they trusted the person who told them they should go to the library, and that's why they go. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> As I tend to do everything. I think the other thing that's really interesting about, about the notion of listening to what the student's doing in terms of creating their own space, um, and this goes back to some of the sort of ethnography that you've done and some of the studies that have been done here as well, is just watching the way the space is actually used. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's really interesting to note in, say, libraries, for example, that the most one of the most popular spaces in the library is sitting on a wall. Because on that wall are where the PowerPoints are for the cleaners. Yeah. To plug in the vacuum. They go like this. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it, 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 it's also a process not necessarily of listening, just listening to students, but watching yep. the behaviours. Because in many ways, I mean, it's not like an ancient documentary, we won't have to say that we're talking over the top of it. <laughs> but although that would be interesting. That would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think, I think in some ways this is a, this is an evolving process. Yes. I mean, we often use the word innovation and change, and they become quite pejorative. But the notion of it being evolving, mm -hmm. that we talk about it now, it's not going to be the same in, in, in a year's yeah. time. It's not going to be the same in two years' time. Yeah. I thought it was really fascinating. We, uh, Julie and I, both had a, a delegation from the Norwegian Business School here this morning, <laughs> looking at what we're doing. One of the first questions they asked was. Oh, you've got this amazing green space in the centre of campus, Lincoln's in field. Yeah. They said, can you get Wi-Fi in there? Because for them, green space is only used a couple of months of the year. The rest of the time, it's particularly for their Bergen and Trondheim campuses, yes. it's under snow. Right, so, not so advisable to work. Yeah, not so advisable. Well. So for them, it was just like, you've got this space. And yeah. a, you could use it for, is it Wi-Fi? Yeah. So I think there's some really interesting things from, like, not just our own observations in London, and that yeah. goes back to the spreading it out, but how other... Places who have different spaces observe student use as well. Yes, well, and so I, I work in North Carolina. We have lots and lots and lots of open <coughs> outdoor spaces. We have a whole lot of sunshine, and we have a whole lot of weather where it's perfectly reasonable to do academic work outside big chunks of the year. Um, so one of the things we're doing at my institution is thinking about outdoor furniture and outdoor configurations that can also facilitate academic work. But the Wi-Fi thing is confounded, right? How do we make sure that there is enough connectivity so that they can actually do all the things. So how do you make them flexible learning spaces and not just spaces where you can only work with stuff that's not connected? Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's challenging. Mm -hmm. I think it's great to have all that view of shared space, especially in London. But I think also, well, I think that's actually the catalyst to get students to work together. I mean, I, when our students come here, they don't necessarily talk to your students. Well, again, I, I think they're already doing that. I mean, I think it's evident that you've got students who are already sort of pre-connected from a variety of ways, and then they, they come into the spaces. But again, I think the notion of, of co-curriculum, right? So you, so you can connect programs from different universities and have the students encounter each other outside of the classrooms, um, outside of the more sort of formal instructional environment of a university. And, and that can be a place where the relationships can grow. I know that members of academic staff are connected to each other as colleagues, right? So how do you leverage those pre-existing relationships so that they trickle down to your students? Um, there, there's almost an um, intellectual lineage 
argument to be made. You know, I, uh, this was my archaeology professor, and they walked me over to this other archaeology professor at this other institution, and, and that's why I know that student from that institution. So having it be organic and, and growing out of relationships that are already there. This is the thing. The relationships are already there, but they're, but they're not recognized, and they're not leveraged um, in ways that they really, they're really creepy. So, so you need to make an argument to senior management. Um, but, but what would it look like? Is it just about talking to people? Are, are there like digital visualization things? Are you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it feels to me, I just left academia. All right. I am now in consulting. <laughs> and I actually miss Edger Room. Oh yeah. That's so pretty amazing. I mean, you walk in and whoa, I'm connected. It's amazing. Yeah. So in a way, I feel like, cause I'm an alum, I'm an alumni. Mm -hmm. But um, the thing is that uh, I'm not, I mean, I wouldn't make the outrageous proposal to allow alumni to have Ed Jerome for all of their life or something. Why not? But why not in a way? Because you're talking about the relationships that exist and that you're trying to foster. I would totally make that a major yeah. suggestion. Let's because have it. Alumni are all like, hey, let's have yeah, it. Yeah, it. <laughs> why not? At the LSE campus, you know, I just, you know, and a lot of campus working is happening all over the place. Yeah. I mean, campus style mm -hmm. working. Yeah. But a, lo a lot of times, especially if you have a, an academic background, you did a discipline kind of study at a Russell Group University. Yes. Um, you kind of miss that. You miss that. You do miss that. So this is directly analogous to, I'm thinking about the library thing, where alums who, people who are at university, they get used to having access to all those databases and all of the articles, and they can do all the things, and then they go out into... Um, the private sector, and they need to do some research, and then they resort to ICANN has PDF, right? Because how else are you going to get that stuff if you can't afford to buy the big things? This is why open access, right? This is an open access argument. Excuse me for just realizing this. This is an open <laughs> access argument for physical and digital spaces at university, right? If, if we think we've got a really good thing going, if you can make the open access argument for your publications, for your data, for the stuff, that you are doing in your research, you can make an open access argument for the other pieces of the university. And if it's an ethical obligation for us to consider open access for these other things, why isn't it an ethical obligation for us to consider open access for the rest of it? There we go. Okay. Because ethics is operated by economics. Um, I come from an institution that hasn't been mentioned here, the bottom of the league table. The unrecruited people will lose their jobs because we inhabit a neoliberal environment. Mm. And um, I'm not an anthropologist, but I feel like I'm in capitalism trying. Um, You're very welcome. Well, <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. No, because, yeah. because actually, I mean, the, I think the, the space isn't neutral. Mm -hmm. I think it's shot through by all sorts of class based values, yep. ethnicity, gender. Mm -hmm. My students would not feel comfortable. I mean, I suppose I feel really emotional about it because actually I think this is the actuality mm -hmm. that although we can talk about pushing away and talking to senior management, we're all over this, this, this um, grotesque economic discipline, which is the market and it's increased. Now, I'm fascinated if you guys don't feel you are, but at London Met we are. We've just lost 180 staff. Yeah, so I think... I agree. And I don't see, yeah. I don't see, I don't see an answer in the liberal, liberal position in a way, because I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm not a Marxist, but if I were, I would say, where's the power in all of this? Yes. So I think that in an, in an open access argument like this, part of what you can do is make the argument that the places that have less power need to have as allies the places with more power so that that kind of access can be more yeah, widespread. That, 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 I, I agree, and, and that may well work at the collegial level of academics, but I can see a situation, I'm sorry, maybe I'm, I'm reading this entirely wrongly, but I can see a situation where students are paying £9,000 at UCL. My mm -hmm. son's about to go to UCL, but the Institute of Archaeology. There you go. They would not want to come to London Met and work with students who, frankly, they, they're extremely majority of the time, or much of the time. 
Maybe that's a problem. They wouldn't want to work with students that they felt were not able, or, or colleagues like me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm an academic, so I must be proud. Hey, I'm, I'm not yeah. someone who, who can, who, who de therefore satisfies mm -hmm. what they want from university. And I, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, sorry if I'm kind of interjecting a different note, but no, I think I'm, that's great. I'm in habit of different worlds in this one. I would love, though, to push back against that, right? If if that if you've got students who are like. I'm not hanging out with those people. Again, why the hell are you in London if you're going to isolate yourself from people that you don't perceive to be like? I mean, I think I, well, I agree. I think that there's a comfort in, in, thing. In a way, but for yeah. example, my, my students, 70% um, of them live at home. Yeah. Because they're working class students, mm -hmm. they're, they're minority ethnic backgrounds. Um, they don't conform to that the sort of um, template mm -hmm. that I think. I'm sorry, but the template around which a lot of this thinking is based, and therefore, I, I don't. Many of my students are Muslim women, mm -hmm. and and therefore, the idea that students don't kind of congregate in order to be like be with people who are like them, yes, I don't recognise that because mm -hmm. in many ways, people come to London Met because they are with people who, who don't deliver racism, yes, who don't, you know, who don't don't speak. So my institution, UNC Charlotte, is not the flagship. Our traditional student is the non-traditional student. Half of our students who come to us every year are transfer students from further education or other four-year um, higher education institutions. We have a tremendous percentage of students who are first generation. We have an extremely diverse campus mm -hmm. in terms of race, ethnicity, um, religion, all the rest of it. They look like university students not because they fit the template that's set by our flagship institution, but because they're at university. So it seems to me that what might be possible um, is a suggestion that you could expand that template by connecting the universities in London to each other such that people don't get to assume that that kind of person isn't actually a university student or that sort of approach to having a community that makes you comfortable even as, as I said, you, you want students to be comfortable. So it's not that you don't always get to hang out with people with whom you're comfortable, but you're provided safe opportunities <coughs> to encounter people who perhaps make you uncomfortable or who you've never encountered before, that sort of thing. Those are things that take resources. Those are things that take a certain amount of confidence mm -hmm. in the reason that you would do that, but it's, it doesn't seem to me to be an argument against that sort of thing so no, much as I a different facet to what could happen. I don't, I don't think it is an argument against yeah. it, but you know, when, when in the NSS mm -hmm. you get students saying, I don't see why we don't want to hold on to London Met mm -hmm. to work with students who aren't, haven't got three A's, three A's, sure. and, and, and I don't want to work with them. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can brush that aside because our management looks at that and says, oh, you know, we don't want that reputation. Sure, so and there's a, I think there's a larger conversation that we probably shouldn't try to have here. But again, what is the point of education? Is the point of higher ed in particular to make students so comfortable that they give super duper thumbs up on the NSS? Because I don't think it is. And this is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that I think things like the NSS are insidious because it presents higher education as some sort of popularity contest instead of as a way for us to educate people such that they can become informed citizens and go out in the world and do effective things. Yeah, and so the, I agree, I think. Bottom, but we're bottom of the league. Yes, game. I understand so, that. And, you know, it's yeah. not very well to say that, that the NSS doesn't matter and we should just ignore it. No, so it clearly does awesome matter. Anyway. It clearly does matter and that's the problem. Yeah. So how so do we I'm shift the narrative it. around this sort of thing? Andrew? Can I join you at the bottom of the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can see places. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my point earlier about the co curriculum might be helpful here. So I, I, the reason I did make the point about coming down from outside of London is because of something that you're saying. If you go outside of London, you don't have so many um, universities represented in one room. It's unlikely. If you go to Sheffield, you've got uh, Sheffield University, you've got Sheffield Town, you go to Manchester, you've got Met, you've got right. the University of Manchester, and Salford's just around the corner. But there is Polarity is much more evident. Sure. Coming back to that point about looking just outside or at the side of the curriculum, um, I don't think uh, I, I think that is the space where we actually um, 
begin to value each other across our universities. I mean, even looking at the tradition of universities in, in the provinces, you know, there's the sports exchange, and, mm -hmm. and there are social spaces, and uh, within the cities, um, but also within the institutions where, and also shared accommodation and so forth. Yep. So there are many examples of how we already try to break down these things. And in fact, what we're saying here is, come on, there must be a way forward. I think the way forward, the inclusive way forward, the valuable way forward, the democratic way forward, we can already see examples of it. And um, yeah, I, I would also note that there is a bit of a class issue here. Sure. And, you know, I come from the open agenda, if you, if you mm -hmm. like, and for me that's one of the motivations for me to be in this. I think it's a real issue that you've raised, but I think there are ways forward so, so the way around privilege, though, isn't to ignore it, particularly not for privileged institutions to say, oh, well, you know, we have problems too. But for institutions with privilege to recognize it and then commit to leveraging it so that there's more privilege distributed throughout the system and so that eventually you don't have quite so much of a disparity between them. And that's relevant for the, you know, for the students all the way through, right? How do you get access to a wider range of people? Is that a you don't have to go home but you can't stay here sort of thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, if we didn't realize too much. Then. Um, yes, I think all, so universities exist in society, right? So the problems of society are going to be shot through the university. We've got problems with class, we've got problems with equity of a variety of different kinds, we have problems with diversity and um, with people being uncomfortable with particular kinds of cultural diversity. Those things exist and those things need to be confronted when we're talking about, you know, how do we, how do, we do open? How do we do all of these sorts of things? And, and you're right, there are going to be arguments that are made by people who have an awful lot of privilege and haven't had to think too much about it, and then there are gonna be other arguments that need to be listened to from people who are at a different position in the system. Yes, but, this, but we've got five years, right? relationship with Leeds Met, mm -hmm. now known as Beckett or something or whatever? Yeah, Leeds Beckett. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, the thing is that Leeds Met had some amazing academics, and we all knew that. And I know Sheffield Hallam has amazing academics, and I'm sure London Met, I, I mean, I'm, don't take that the wrong way, I just don't know. But, I mean, sometimes yeah. you, you have opportunities because mm -hmm. you're not and I, it just feels like that's kind of, like, maybe. Yeah. So, so I will say the argument that I'm making is a profoundly anti-neoliberal argument about why we're educating and how we're educating. Just raising a point here that you yeah. from London and haven't yet experienced the diversity, what could universities do to make that more visible, right? So, so I, there, I have a lot of students at UNC Charlotte who are from Charlotte who have always been there and the reason they went is because, yeah, and, and life means you, you go where you are. But we have an opportunity to expand what it means to be at Charlotte, to have being at Charlotte be more than just whatever their lived experience was before they got to university. Yeah. I don't think you can assume that and just yes. decide that if that's Oh no, I was just, I was just 
Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I agree. Okay. Thank, thank you so much for indulging in this conversation. I really appreciate it. I, thank you. I'd like to thank Donna for...